We're going to spend Lesson 7 and Lesson 8 looking at Mary. This is interesting because, in fact, there's not a huge amount written about her in the Gospels, but what there is is really telling. So the first week, we're going to have a look at her place in Matthew's Gospel. The second lesson, we're going to have a look at the other Gospels, but also a little bit of the, the life of Mary in the tradition of the church. Because in some ways, we know not much, but almost too much about Mary. She is the climax of the family tree. She is the end of the story that leads us into the beginning of Jesus' story. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. She's the only one who has that unique addition of whom was born, of whom Jesus was born. You'll also note that um, the whole of the genealogy is in two, depends on how, how you read it, but maybe two parts, one up to David and one from David to Jesus. She's the only woman mentioned in this second part. The others are all in the earlier part. She has a unique place. It's also important, I think, to have a little bit of a think about how Mary's story has expanded into the life and traditions of the church, because that also tells us something about her unique position, how she has um, called to people's experience and longings. And I think it's well worth spending time with that. How does she fit with the other grandmothers is kind of a tricky question and different people answer it different ways. She's not a foreigner, she's Jewish. She is a sexual transgressor um, along with the others in that she is pregnant out of wedlock. And there is some suggestion that maybe the others are there to get us into the habit of suspending our judgments when we come to Mary to thinking about what are the deeper questions and, and stories that are going on, maybe. Like the others, though, she is also vulnerable. She's in a very um, tender time of life. She, she is still a girl in the ancient Near East who have very conscribed ideas about what they can and can't do and their position in the family but she is also strong and she speaks from the margins in ways that let the story of salvation come to its climax. Matthew dives right into the story once he's gone past the family tree. There are a series of verbs about things that happened to Mary. She was engaged to Joseph. She was found to be with child. Joseph plans to dismiss her but he subsequently takes her as his wife. Like the other women, Mary seems to have a whole lot of things happening to her. We'll look at Luke's Gospel in the next lesson, which gives Mary a lot more of her own voice. But here in Matthew, it all happens to her. We have no sense at this stage of what she feels in the midst of all of this action. We don't have her spoken response. And I wonder whether her passivity in Matthew's story is showing and highlighting her vulnerability. The angel comes to Joseph and Mary's um, fate depends on Joseph's response to the angel. So let's think a little bit about Mary in her social context. An arranged marriage as they were um, in the ancient Near East and often are in other places even now. What she brings is her virginity, her purity, her ability to make an honourable alliance between families and hopefully on the part of her family that she'll be able to do that with a, a somewhat more powerful and more wealthy family than her own. If she fails to do that, she is shaming not just herself, but her whole family. So here is Mary, pregnant outside wedlock. 
not just in personal disgrace, but likely to cause her entire family to be ostracised. It's almost unthinkable for many of us what this might have meant for her. It's not unthinkable for other people to know that the judgment on them is going to smash the delicate social balance that lets life flourish. I have friends who've worked quite a lot in the Middle East and they became used to the tragedy of honour killings. Of women who had been raped by men and then are killed by their brothers or father because their sexual um, impurity, though no fault of their own, is, has brought disgrace on the family. So where Mary stood in this is not unknown. So we have Mary on the one hand in a really, really dangerous place. On the other hand, we have Joseph, who is called a righteous man. I think in many ways in, in the genealogy, Joseph echoes Boaz. We've got the pillar of the community, the man who has the power to hold the family steady and who has absolute power over the life of this young girl. He chooses to be merciful. So he could choose to be right and have her disgraced, possibly even stoned to death. He chooses to be merciful, which is to have her sent away quietly where she can have the baby and no one needs to know about it. So already we've got a Joseph who is showing care for the person over care for the law. I wonder what the word righteous means for you. It's a word that we're, yeah, it's a little bit funny these days, isn't it? Sometimes we can think of it with self in front of it, self-righteous. But in biblical language, it's a really important word. It's often linked with justice. And it is this sense of people doing everything they can do to care for each other and to make sure that community flourishes. What might that look like for you? And how do you think of Joseph when we are told that he is righteous? You might like to pause for a little while and talk about that.